All right, welcome. Thanks for, for tuning in here. We are going to be doing a deep dive into the concepts uh, and the relationships between power, force, truth, uh, and love and in terms of uh, secularity and in terms of uh, Christianity. And we're going to be using this wonderful book, The Meditations on the Tarot, um, which is uh, subtitles A Journey into Christian Hermeticism, which I highly recommend. Um, it was it was published anonymously, I think, in the 70s, and then the, the author came to light, and he has a very a sound and authentic understanding of the Christian story, at least from my perspective and from what I can uh, make sense of that. Uh, it's actually got an afterword by Cardinal Hans Urs von Balthasar as well, which I was going to read. But I wanted to get into this, uh, you know, what's been going around this corner of the internet is this idea of the, the difference between power and authority and how can we understand um, something like Nietzsche's Superman uh, with regards to the crucified Christ. What is, the, what is the relationship there? And he actually brings this up early on. So I'm going to start reading and we're going to, going to do a, cl a close reading slash analysis here um, and kind of see how it goes. I really like this, that he brings in this Ubermensch, the Superman, Nietzsche's Superman, right? Where the idea is that you will revalue it, revalue values or you'll create your own values. Um, and it's interesting, the you know, authentic uh, Christian story, I think, speaks to that beautifully uh, and accurately and and totally um so we're just going to start here um so he says gov i'm about three four pages in uh because i wanted to hopefully get through the end of it it's probably about 10 12 pages uh it says god governs the world by authority and not by force if this were not so there would be neither freedom nor law in the world and the first three petitions of the lord's prayer would lose all meaning at our Father who art in heaven. He who prays these petitions does so solely with the purpose of affirming, affirming and increasing divine authority and not divine power. The God who is almighty, not virtually, but actually, has no need at all to be petitioned that his reign may come and that his will may be done. The meaning of this prayer is that God is powerful only insofar as that his authority is freely recognized and accepted. I mean, this is extremely important currently with the idea of the forced compassion or weaponized compassion, or this idea that we should be, that we can be forced to be better people from, an, from the state in a sense, which I think is uh, uh, one of the root causes of complete catastrophes, uh, especially in the 20th century. All right, back to the text here. Prayer is the act of such recognition and acceptance, one is free to be believing or unbelieving. Nothing and no one can compel us to have faith. No scientific discovery, no logical argument, no physical torture can force us to believe. I wonder what you think about that idea. I.e. to freely recognize and accept the authority of God. But on the other hand, once this authority is recognized and accepted, the powerless become powerful. Then divine power can manifest itself. And this is why it is said that a grain of faith is sufficient to move mountains. So let me know what you think about that idea right there. Now, the problem of authority is at the same time of, and this is these three categories that are treated throughout this book here. Now, the problem of authority is at the same time of the mystical, Gnostic, magical, and hermetic significance. We're going to get more into the hermetic aspect of it um, later on here. It comprises the Christian mystery of crucifixion and the, quote, mystery of withdrawal of the Lurianic Kabbalah. Here are some considerations which can help us to arrive at a most profound meditation upon this mystery. The Christian world worships the crucifix, i.e. the image expressing the paradox of the almighty God reduced to a state of extreme powerlessness. I think this needs to be meditated on, this idea, because it's key to so much. I'll read it again. Uh, the Christian world worships the crucifix, i.e. the image expressing the paradox of Almighty God reduced to a state of extreme powerlessness. And it is in this paradox that one sees the highest revelation of the divine in the whole history of mankind. One sees there the most perfect revelation of the God of love. The Christian creed says, for our sake he was crucified, quote, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
the only Son of the Eternal Father nailed to the cross for our sake. This is what is divinely impressed upon all open souls, including the robber crucified to the right. This impression is unforgettable and inexpressible. It is the immediate breath of God which has inspired and still inspires thousands of martyrs, confessors of the faith, virgins, and recluses. But it is not to say every human being finding himself facing the crucifixion may be thus divinely moved. There are those who react in the opposite way. It was so at the time of Calvary. It is, it is so today, quote, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, if you are the son of God, come down for that cross. The chief sacrificers with the scribes and elders also mocked him saying, quote, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If he is the king of kings, the, kings of, the king of Israel, let him come down from that cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he loves him, it's from Matthew. This is the other reaction. Now in days we encounter this exactly the same. For example, in Soviet radio broadcasts from Moscow, Remember, this was written in the 70s. The argument for Moscow is always the same. If God exists, he must know that we, the communists, dethrone him. Why does he not give a visible sign, if not of his power, at least of his existence? Why does he not defend his own interests? This, in other words, the old argument, come down from the cross and we will believe in you. I cite these well-known things because they reveal a certain dogma underlying them. It is the dogma of is the dogma or philosophical principle which states that truth and power are identical. Truth and power are identical. I mean, this is uh, the heart of Foucault, right? All, all uh, knowledge is power, power relations. All institutions are just manifestations of this power. So this dogma that he's identifying here is that truth and power are identical. That which is powerful is true and that which is powerless is false. That's the idea. According to this dogma, or philosophical principle which has become that of modern technological science, power is the absolute criterion and supreme ideal of truth. Only that which is powerful is of the divine. Will to power 101. Now there are open and secret worshipers of the idol of power, for it is an idol and the source of all idolatry. So he says here, and I agree, um, there are open and secret worshipers of the idol of power, for it is an idol and the source of all idolatry, also in Christian factions or in religious and spiritual circles in general. I'm not speaking about Christian or spiritually minded princes and politicians who covet power, but rather about the adherence to doctrines advancing the primacy of power. Here there are two categories, those who aspire to the ideal of the quote-unquote superman and those who believe in a god that is actually almighty and therefore responsible for all that happens. So here's the dichotomy. Amongst exotericists, occultists, and magicians, there are many, be it openly or secretly, who aspire to the ideal of the superman. In the meantime, they often pose as masters or high priestess worthy of the acclaim of the future superman. They are at the same time singularly in agreement in that they raise God far, very far to the heights of absolute abstraction so that it does not discomfort them by his too concrete presence and in order that they have room for themselves to be able to develop their own greatness without the rival grandeur of the divine to discomfort them. They build their individual towers of Babel which fall. As a rule, according to the law of the towers of Babel and experience sooner or later, a salutary fall is as is the teaching of the 16th card of the Tarot. Remember, this is a, a letter uh, and a meditation on each card of the Tarot. This is the fourth card, uh, which is the Emperor. Uh, the first one treated here is the Magician, then the um, Priestess, uh, High Priestess, number four is the Emperor. We'll get into that a little bit here. But and Where was I here? Right, they build their individual towers of Babel, which fall as a rule. They do not fall from a real height into a real abyss. It is only from an imaginary height that they fall, and they fall only to the ground, i.e., they learn a lesson that we human beings of today have all learned or have still to learn. This is very interesting in light of the idea of uh, placing God, of Lacan, 
the God of Lagan from the imaginary into the real. Because it's just in, in this idea of the Tower of Babel or of this fall, it's always a fall from the imaginary ego projection of the authority of the self, the self-positing self. Back to the text here. The worship of the idol of, of power conceived of as the Superman, the Ubermensch, above all when one identifies oneself with it, is relatively inoffensive, being fundamentally infantile, infantile. But this is not so with the other category of power worshipers. Just quickly in this idea of uh, the worship of the idol of power being infantile, in uh, psychoanalysis, the idea of uh, desire for the mother and the desire for the other is all situated in the infant, in the uh, early childhood. As the infant comes into the world, emerges through language, uh, this inculcation of the desire of power, of the desire of, the, of what the other desires, essentially. Um, so I think he's right when he's calling in this infantile. So right, back to the text. But this is not so with the other category of power worshipers, namely those who project this ideal onto God himself. Their faith in God depends only on the power of God. If God was powerless, they would not believe in him. It is they who teach that God has created souls predestined to eternal damnation and others predestined to salvation. It is they who make God responsible for the entire history of the human race, including all its atrocities. God, they say, chastises his disobedient children by means of wars, revolutions, tyrannies, and other similar things. How could, be, how could it be otherwise? God is almighty, therefore all that happens is only able to happen through his action and through his consent. The idol of power has such a hold on some human minds that they prefer a God who is a mixture of good and evil, provided that he is powerful, to a God of love who governs only by the intrinsic authority of the divine, by truth, beauty, and goodness, i.e. they prefer a God who is actually almighty to the crucified God. However, the father in the parable of the prodigal child had neither sent his son far from his paternal home in order to lead a life of debauchery, nor did he prevent him from leaving and forced him to lead a life which was pleasing to him, the father. All he did was to await his return and to go and meet him, um, go meet with the prodigal son was approaching his father's home. Everything which took place in the story of the prodigal son, save for his return to the father, was clearly contrary to the will of the father. Very interesting, again, in light of uh, Lacan, as we our ego is instantiated through the taking on the name of the father, right? And this, this uh, story, I mean, this is where we get the parable of if you love something, let it go. If it comes back to you, you know, that's a little bit of a superficial um, explanation of it. Uh, but there, th this notion of free will is so central and important, it can't be overestimated. Uh, all right, back here. Uh, now, the history of the human race since the fall is that of the prodigal son. It is not a matter of, quote, the law of involution and evolution according to the divine plan of modern theosophists, but rather of an abuse of freedom similar to that of the prodigal son. And the key formula of the history of humanity is to be found neither in the progress of civilization nor in the process of evolution or in any other, quote, unquote, process, but rather in the parable of the prodigal son. In the words, quote, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. It's from Luke. Is mankind therefore solely responsible for its history? Without a doubt, because it is not God who has willed it to be as such. God is crucified in it. One understands this when one takes account of the significance of the fact of human freedom, and likewise the freedom of the beings of the spiritual hierarchies, the angels, archangels, principalities, powers, virtues, dominions, thrones, cherubim, seraphim. All these beings, including man, the ischim, I-S-C-H-I-M, have an existence that is either real or illusionary. illusionary. If they have a real existence, if they are not a mirage, they are independent entities endowed not only with a phenomenal independence, but also a nominal independence. Now, this distinction he makes between the phenomenal and the nominal is, was popularized by Kant, saying that we cannot know things in themselves. We only know their appearance, their phenomenal appearance in our world. We don't know the thing in themselves, which is their essence, which is titled the nominal here. 
Now, noumenal independence is what we understand by freedom. That's interesting, right? So he's saying freedom is the thing in itself here, right? Now, noumenal independence is what we understand by freedom. Freedom, in fact, is nothing other than the real and complete existence of a being created by God. To be free and to exist are synonymous from a moral and spiritual point of view. Just as morality would not exist without freedom, so would an unfree spiritual entity, soul or spirit, not exist for itself, but would be part of another spiritual entity which is free, i.e., which really exists. Freedom is the spiritual existence of beings. Freedom is the spiritual existence of beings. When we read in the scripture that God created all beings, the essential meaning here is that God has given freedom or existence to all beings. Freedom once having been given, God does not take it back. This is why the beings of the ten hierarchies mentioned above are immortal. Death, not separation from the body, but real death, would be the absolute deprivation of liberty, i.e. complete destruction of the existence given by God. But who or what can take the divine gift of freedom, the divine gift of existence from a being? Freedom existence is inalienable, and the beings of the ten hierarchies are immortal. The statement, very greatest, the statement, freedom or existence is inalienable, can be understood as the highest gift, the very greatest value imaginable. Then this would be a foretaste of paradise or as condemnation to quote unquote perpetual existence. Perpetual existence, kind of like what the transhumanist uh, ideal of downloading your consciousness into machines to become immortal. Think about that in light of this idea. I'll read it again. He says, This statement, freedom or existence is inalienable, can be understood as the highest gift, the very greatest value imaginable. Then this would be a foretaste of paradise or as condemnation to perpetual existence. Then this would be a foretaste of hell because no one, quote unquote, sends us anywhere. Freedom not being a theater, it is freedom not being a theater. It is we ourselves who make the choice. I think that's why the first Matrix movie, as an aside here, was, was so important um, and so impactful, at least, because it really hammered this idea of choice down, of, of being kind of the, uh, the purview of the human condition, this choice. Love existence and you have chosen heaven. Hate it and there you have chosen hell. Now, God is with respect to free beings, either the ruling king in the sense of authority, such as that taught by the fourth arcanum of the tarot, or the crucified. He is king with regard to the, those of his beings who voluntarily accept, who quote-unquote believe his authority. He is crucified with respect to those beings who abuse their freedom and quote-unquote worship idols, i.e. who replace divine authority by substitute. Now, this substitute is, this is idolatry, right? This is idols, this is ideology. Any relationship at this apex of your consciousness outside of the mysterious infinite uh, father and the, and the Trinity always leads to the building of idols and ideologies and to a lesser or greater extent of their degeneracy or um, deleteriousness. But it's always false if there isn't the appropriate comportment towards the highest ideal, the highest high. Um, and in a Christian sense, that uh, from my perspective, it is the, uh, the Trinity and the relationship of the Trinity it can tell us so much about our psyche and how we are to be in the world with others. All right, back to the text here. King and crucified at one and the same time. This is the mystery of Pilate's inscription on the cross of Calvary. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Almighty and powerful both at once. This is why miracles of healing in human history were able to be accomplished by saints whilst bloody wars and disasters raged around them. Freedom. Freedom is the true throne of God and is his cross at the same time. Freedom is the key to comprehension of the role of God in history, to comprehension of the God of love and the God King without the sacrilege of making him a tyrant and without the blasphemy of doubting his power or of doubting his very existence. 
God is all-powerful in history in as much as there is faith, and he is crucified in so far as one turns away from him. Thus, divine crucifixion follows from the fact of freedom or the fact of the real existence of the beings of the ten hierarchies when it is the matter of the world governed by divine authority and not compulsion. Let us turn now to the idea of Tzimtzum, which is this quote-unquote withdrawal of God. And if you follow my uh, work on Heidegger, I mean, if you follow Heidegger or read Heidegger, this idea of the withdrawal of being uh, from beings is, is key. And it's interesting he's bringing this in here. Uh, and he uses the term T-S-I-M-T-S-U-M, Tzimtzum, which is the withdrawal of God uh, through the Lurianic school of the Kabbalah. So the doctrine of the Tzimtzum, or this withdrawal, reveals one of the, quote, three mysteries in the Kabbalah. San Hijrad, the mystery of union. Sad Hislamistam, the mystery of concentration or divine withdrawal. And Sad Hagilgal, the mystery of reincarnation of the revolution of souls. Now we're going to go over these three, and I find a very original or fascinating interpretation of reincarnation from a, a Christian perspective here coming, which is this third mystery. So this first mystery is the mystery of union. The second mystery is the mystery of concentration or divine withdrawal. And the third is the mystery of reincarnation or revolution of souls. The two other mysteries, quote unquote mysteries, the mystery of union and that of the revolution of souls will be treated later in other letters as well. So letter 10, for example, he talks about concerning the quote mystery of the divine withdrawal or concentration which interests here, it is a question of the thesis that the existence of the universe is rendered possible by the act of a contraction of God within himself. God made a quote-unquote place for the world in abandoning a region interior to himself. So interesting, he's going to bring up, they're bringing up the idea of the void and the existence of the void. It's not being separate from God per se. It is God withdrawing and in this vacuum, in this space, the void manifests itself and this withdrawal is also the, the point of concentration, is the, also the point of pulling being out of non-being. Um, you can see it, like pulling the, the flower, the seed to rose into flower into a flower bud, right? This is this idea of, of uh, this is a, an idea of worship that I, I kind of have in my head. Um, so he brings in this quote. All right, I'm going to skip the quote here. He says, in other words, in order to create the world ex nihilo, God had first to bring the void in self into existence. He had to withdraw within it, within order to create a mystical space, a space without his presence, the void. Remember, the void in modern psychoanalysis is the at the heart of human subjectivity, and they are right. They are right in terms of subjectivity. So he had to withdraw within an order to create a mystical space, a space without his presence, the void, and it is in thinking this thought that we assist at the birth of freedom. For as Burdjedev has formulated, quote, freedom is not determined by God. It is part of the nothing out of which God created the world. Now the void, the mystical space from which God withdraws, withdrew himself through this act of Timsum, is the place of origin of freedom. So yeah, just reviewing, right? So this place, the space of God's withdrawal is not only the place of the origin of freedom, it is the thing in itself that underlies all appearance and phenomenal um, appearances of things in the world. I.e. the place of origin of an existence. Now you separate the term uh, ex from istance, ex istance, which is absolute potentiality, not in a, any way determined. And all of the beings of the ten created hierarchies are the children of God and freedom, born of divine plenitude and the void. They carry within themselves a quote-unquote drop of the void and a quote-unquote spark of God. Their existence, their freedom, is the void within them. Their essence, their spark of love, is the divine quote-unquote blood within them. They are immortal because the void is indestructible, and the monad proceeding from God is also indestructible. Further, these two indestructible elements, the menonic element, mi on, the void, and the pleromic element, pliroma, plenitude, are indissolubly bound to one another. So the void and, and, the, and the plenitude, uh, you know, is ultimately, I mean, this is the yin-yang idea, right? There's always a little bit of a, a yin in yang. There's always a little bit of, of darkness and light and always a little bit of lightness and dark. 
And this is, uh, in some sense, the spiritual material structure of, of, of reality um, that he's working through here. So the idea of this withdrawal, the withdrawal of God in order to create freedom, and that of divine crucifixion on account of freedom are in complete accordance. For the withdrawal of God in order to make space for freedom and his renunciation of the use of his power against the abuse of freedom within determined limits are only two aspects of the same idea. It goes without saying that the idea of this withdrawal and that of divine crucifixion is inapplicable when God is conceived of as in the sense of pantheism. Pantheism, like materialism, does not admit the real existence of individual beings. Therefore, the fact of freedom, not merely apparent freedom, is excluded. For pantheism and for materialism, there is no question and cannot be of a divine withdrawal or a divine crucifixion. On the other hand, the Kabbalistic doctrine of Timsum is the only serious explanation that I know of concerning creation ex nihilo, which is of a kind to act as a counterbalance to pure and simple pantheism. Moreover, it constitutes a deep link between the Old and New Testament in bringing to light the cosmic significance of the idea of sacrifice. Well said. Now, the reflection of the idea of divine withdrawal and divine crucifixion is found to be indicated, as we have seen, in the fourth arcanum of the tarot, the emperor. Again, I'll see if I can put a picture here of um, the symbolism of the emperor here. This is a very symbolic meditation on these different, uh, the major arcana of the tarot. This isn't uh, in a sense of divination. This is, uh, you know, I, I, the tarot came about in a very Christian world, and the deep symbolism and this, the narrative and the story behind each symbol and its connection to the other symbols is, is absolutely um, deep. And it doesn't have to be in this new age sense uh, looked at that way. So, sorry. So, so now the reflection of the idea of divine withdrawal and divine crucifixion is found to be indicated as we have seen in the fourth arcanum of the tarot. The emperor. The emperor reigns by pure authority. He reigns over free beings. Right, the emperor, the, the shadow of the emperor is the, the tyrant, right? So this is talking about the way to have power, political power or power in the world appropriately. The emperor in its best sense embodies this, this idea, right? But it also has the shadow of, uh, of the tyrant, the corrupt, um, you know, tyrant. So, sorry. The emperor reigns with, by pure authority, he reigns over free beings, i.e. not by means of the sword, but by means of the scepter. And as you can see, the scepter is really front and center in this uh, symbol, uh, the symbol here of the emperor. The scepter itself bears a globe with a cross above. The scepter therefore expresses in a clear and possible, uh, as possible a manner, the central idea of the arcanum, just as the world, the globe, is ruled by the cross, so is the power of the emperor over the terrestrial globe, subject to the sign of the cross. The power of the emperor reflects divine power, and just as the latter is affected by divine contraction, tim sum, this withdrawal, and by voluntary divine powerlessness, the crucifixion, so the power of the emperor is affected by the contraction of his personal forces, the belt drawn tight on the emperor here in this card and by voluntary immobility, the crossed legs of the emperor at his post, the seat or throne of the emperor. The post of the emperor, what an abundance of ideas concerning the post, its historical mission, its functions in the light of natural right, and its role in the light of divine right of the emperor of Christendom are to be found amongst medieval authors. As is suitable that the institution of a city or kingdom be made according to the model of the institution of the world. Similarly, it is necessary to draw from the divine government the order ratio of the government of a city. That is the fundamental thesis advanced by the subject of St. Thomas Aquinas. One, this is why authors of the Middle Ages could not imagine Christianity without an emperor, just as they could not imagine the universal church without a pope. Because if the world is governed hierarchically, Christianity or sanctum imperium cannot be otherwise. Hierarchy is a pyramid which exists only when it is complete, and it is the emperor who is its summit. Then come the kings, the dukes, noblemen, citizens, and peasants, but it is the crown of the emperor which confers royalty and royal crowns from which the dual crowns and all other crowns in turn derive their authority. The post of the emperor is nevertheless not only the, that of the last, or rather the first instance of sole legitimacy, it was also magical, if we understood by magic the action of correspondences between that which is below and that which is above. 
It was the principle of itself of authority from which all lesser authorities derive not only their legitimacy, but also their hold over the consciousness of the people. This is why royal crowns, one after the other, lost their luster and were eclipsed after the imperial, after the imperial, crown, imperial crown was eclipsed. Monarchies, monarchies are unable to exist for long without the monarchy. Kings cannot apportion the crown and scepter of the emperor among themselves and possess as emperors in their particular countries because the shadow of the emperor is always present. So he's talking about how once you take away this, this, um, this hierarchy, uh, it is that which is above which gives authority to that which is below. And once you take out that which is above, uh, there's no more, uh, order is no, is no longer allowed to manifest. We always focus on the, the, pro the problems with the dark side of this process, which there is a dark side that we've, we've lived through, but that, that doesn't mean that you throw away the structure of spiritual and physical reality because of uh, the darkness that can manifest. Sorry. I'm going to skip a little bit here. I want to get through the rest of this, about 10 more pages, so uh, it's worth it. Because he goes into, he brings in the proletariat here. Um, he says, Europe is haunted by the shadow of the emperor, because when, even when the emperor isn't there, right, there is no more emperor, there's still this shadow of the emperor that's present still. Uh, one senses this his absence just as vividly in the former times one sensed his presence, because the emptiness of the wound speaks that which we miss knows how to make us sense it. I love this, uh, this quote here. Because the emptiness of the wound speaks. That which we miss knows how to make us sense it. He brings in Napoleon here. Um, I'm going to skip a bit here. So now the emperor in the fourth card is alone without a court or retinue. His throne is in no way to be found in a room of the imperial palace, but rather in the open, in the open, in the uncultivated field. So this is in the symbolism of this card, uh, not located in a town. A meager clump of grass by his foot is there as the whole imperial court, as all the witnesses of his imperial splendor, but the clear sky is spread above him. He is a silhouette on the background of the sky, alone in the presence of the sky. This is how the emperor is. One could ask, why is, the astonishing, why is the astonishing fact that the emperor is found with his throne in the open air under the starry sky, if you wish, overlooked by so many authors on the tarot? Why have they not stated the fact that the emperor is alone without a court? I believe that it is because it is rarely that one lets the symbol, the image of the symbol as such, say all that it has to say through, through its unique context. One lets it say a little, and one is suddenly more interested in one's own thoughts, i.e. in what one has to say oneself, rather than what the symbol has to say. Beautifully said, and I think that's the case for symbolism, um, just in general. It's hard to get yourself out of, the, out of the way. Yet the card is specific. The emperor is alone in open air in an uncultivated field with a tuft of grass, as his only company, save for the sky and the earth. The card teaches us the arcanum of the authority of the emperor, although it may be unrecognized, occult, unknown, and unappreciated. It's a matter of the crown, the scepter, the throne, and the coat of arms being guarded without any witness other than the sky of the earth, sky and the earth, by a solitary man leaning against the throne, which with his legs crossed, wearing a crown, holding the scepter, and clasping his belt. It is authority as such. And it is the post of authority as such, which is expressed here. Authority is the magic of spiritual profundity filled with wisdom. Authority is the magic of spiritual profundity filled with wisdom. Or in other words, it is the result of magic based on gnosis due to mystical experience. Authority is the second he in the name Yahweh. But it is not the second he taken separately. It is only when the whole divine name manifests itself. For this reason, it is more correct to say that authority is the completely manifested divine name. Hallowed be thy name, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Saying this reason that authority is the completely manifested divine name. The completely manifested divine name signifies at the same time a post, the post of the emperor or the state of consciousness of the complete synthesis of mysticism, gnosis, and sacred magic. And it is thus this state of consciousness of complete synthesis which is initiation. 
Initiation understood not in the sense of ritual, nor in the sense of the possession of information held by, to be by secret, but rather to the sense of the state of consciousness where eternity and the present moment are one. It is the simultaneous vision of the temporal and the eternal of that which is below and that which is above. So I'm going to move on a little bit here, um, skip here a little bit to, um, we're going to start looking into symbolism as such a little bit more. Uh, we're going to get into kind of a definition of, of dogma. Um, we're going to get into Kant and, and um, you know, maybe I'll do this for another video. It's not too much longer, but um, so I'll leave it there and I'll, there'll be part two to this video um, where we're getting into, um, uh, it's, it's going to continue in this vein and you get a little bit better actually. So uh, thanks for tuning in and um, either I'll put this at the end of this video or it'll be another right. video. So part two thanks, of bye. this um, of this video series, we're going to be getting into, um, we're again on meditations of the tarot, letter four on the emperor talking through um authority and power. Now we're going to be getting into this understanding of hermetic philosophy and this uh, unique uh, definition uh, that's per being provided here, which is consonant with um, kind of Orthodox Christianity, actually, when I believe the, the author was a Catholic. We're going to be getting into um, kind of Kant versus hermeticism, the symbolism. We're going to be kind of getting, getting into um, just more interesting uh, definitions of and expressions of symbolism uh, we're going to be getting into this idea of reincarnation from uh, this perspective um, and we're going to be getting into um, uh, the apocalypse and how the apocalypse is something to be experienced and lived rather than uh, more uh, or less be discerned or philosophized which i found interesting so we'll just get started here uh, please check out part one if you have not so already um, which might even be part of this video so i don't know so he says um, the emperor signifies the authority of initiation or of the initiate. It is due to the complete divine name from the Kabbalistic third point to the, quote, magical great arcanum from the point of view of magic and to the philosopher's stone from the standpoint of alchemy. It is, in other words, the unity and synthesis of mysticism, gnosis, and magic. This unity or synthesis we have designated in the second letter as hermetic philosophy. And here's where we're going to be getting into this idea of hermetic philosophy bound up with the hermetic philosophical sense. This hermetic philosophy is necessary to repeat. It does not signify a philosopher, a philosophy derived or designated from the organism of the unity of mysticism, gnosis and sacred magic. It is this very unity and manifestation. Hermetic philosophy is inseparable from the unity, mysticism, gnosis, magic, as is the second he from the divine name. It is authority or the manifestation of the unity, mysticism, gnosis, magic. Uh, a little bit further on here says the hermeticist is therefore a person who is at one and at the same time a mystic, a Gnostic, a magician, and a quote unquote realist, idealist philosopher. He is a realist, idealist philosopher because he relies as much on experience as on speculative thought, as much on facts as on ideas, because facts and ideas are for him only two aspects of the same real, real, reality, ideality, i.e. the same truth. Hermetic philosophy being the summary and synthesis of mysticism, gnosis, and sacred magic is not a philosophy among other philosophies or a particular philosophical system amongst other particular philosophical systems. This I underline and put this idea of, of symbolism. Um, this idea is not another ideology. This is the inverse of that, right? Uh, I think that's important. And he's calling whatever this thing is that is not another ideology, hermetic philosophy, which of course has been made into, uh, you know, an esoteric occultist ideology, right? So even stuff, something like Orthodox Christianity or whatever it may be, uh, has the ability to become ideology or to become an idol, so it's very there's a very nuanced um, reality here that it's, it's hard to articulate. I'll read it again. Here it says hermetic philosophy being the summary and synthesis of mysticism, mysticism, gnosis, and magic. Magic is this practical application of one's will. It's not a philosophy among other philosophies or a particular philosophical system amongst other particular philosophical philosophical systems. Further on, he says, in fact, 
If you have, oh no, I'm sorry, I gotta read this. He says, just as the Catholic Church, being Catholic or universal, cannot consider itself as a particular church among other particular churches, nor consider its dogmas or as religious opinions among other religious opinions or confessions, so hermetic philosophy, being the synthesis of all that which is essential in the spiritual life of humanity, cannot consider itself as a philosophy among others. Presumption, he asks. It would be, without a doubt, a monstrous presumption if it were a matter of human invention instead of revelation from above. In fact, if you have a truth revealed from above, if the acceptance of this truth brings miracles of healing, peace, and vivification, vivification with it, and if lastly it explains to you a thousand unexplained things that are inexplicable without it, can you then consider it as an opinion among other opinions? Let me know what you think about that idea there. Dogmatism, question mark, he says, yes, if one understands by dogma the certainty due to a revelation of divine worth, which prove fruitful and constructive, and due to the confirmation that they receive from reason and experience together. When one has certainty based on the concordance of divine revelation, divine human operation, and human understanding, how can one act as if one did not have it? It is truly necessary to deny three times, quote, he brings in this quote from uh, that I'm particularly partial to. It is truly necessary to, quote, deny three times before the cock crows in order to be accepted into the good company of, quote, unquote, free spirits and, quote, unquote, non-dogmatics and to be chauffeured along with them by the fire of things relating to human creation. Heresy? Yes, if by heresy one understands the primacy of universal revelation of good works universally recognized as such and of the ideal of universality amongst philosophies. Hermetic philosophy is not a particular philosophy amongst particular existing philosophies. It is not, it is not so already for the sole reason that it does not operate with univocal concepts and their verbal definitions as do philosophies, but rather with arcana, arcana and their symbolic expression. Compare the Emerald Table with the Critique of Pure Reason by Kant and you will see the difference. The Emerald Table, I think he means the Emerald Tablet here, states the fundamental arcana of mystical, Gnostic, magical, philosophical work. The Critique of Pure Reason elaborates an edifice composed of univocal concepts such as the categories of quantity, quality, relation, and modality, which altogether portray the transcendental method of Kant, i.e. the method of, quote, thinking about the act of thought or reflection about reflection. This method, however, is an aspect of the 18th Arcanum of the Tarot, the Moon, as we shall see. Um, and this Arcanum, expressed by the symbol of the card, the Moon, teaches us, teaches in the Hermetic way the essence of what Kant taught in the philosophical way about the transcendental method. So, is Hermetic philosophy only symbolism, pure and simple, and has it nothing to do with the methods of philosophical and scientific reasoning? Yes and no. And here we get into this deep dive into. Uh, symbolism from this perspective. Yes, insofar as hermetic philosophy is of an esoteric nature, i.e. consists of arcana oriented towards the mystery and expressed in symbols. No, insofar as it exercises a stimulating effect on the philosophical and scientific reasoning of its adherents. It is wrapped, so to say, in a philosophical and scientific intellectual penumbra, which is due to the activity of its adherents pursuing the aim of translating, insofar as it is possible to do so the arcana and the symbols of hermetic philosophy into univocal concepts and verbal definitions. It is a process of crystallization because the translation of multivocal concepts of arcana into univocal concepts is comparable to the transition from a state of organic life to the mineral state. It is thus that the occult sciences such as the Kabbalah, astrology, and alchemy are derived from hermetic philosophy. These sciences are able to have their own secrets, but the arcana which are reflected in them belong to the domain of her hermetic philosophy. Insofar as the intellectualization of her hermetic philosophy is the nature of commentary and corollary, it is legitimate and even indispensable. For then one will translate each arcanum into many univocal concepts for three, for example, and by this very fact, one will help the intellectual intellect to habituate itself to think hermetically, i.e. in multivocal concepts or arcana. But when the intellectualization of hermetic philosophy pursues the aim of creating an autonomous system of univocal concepts without formal contradiction between them, it commits an abuse. For instead of helping 
human reason to raise itself above itself, it would set up a greater obstacle for it. It would captivate it instead of freeing it. It's an important section. Uh, please feel free to re re-listen uh, and re reread it. Um, it's important in understanding why this symbolism, this hermetic philosophy, as he calls it, is not an ideology and the difference between uh, this and a systemic ideology, for example. Uh, moving on, he says, the, the occult sciences are therefore derived from her hermetic philosophy by way of intellectualization. That is why one should not consider symbols, the major arcana of the tarot, for example, as allegorical expressions of theories or concepts of these sciences. For it is the opposite which is true. It is the doctrine of the occult sciences which are derived from symbols of the tarot or other symbols, and it is they which are to be considered as intellectually, quote-unquote, allegorical expressions of the symbols and arcana of hermetic esotericism. Thus, it would not do it would not do to say the fourth card, the emperor, as the symbol of the astrological doctrining of Jupiter, doctrining Jupiter. One would rather say the arcanum of the fourth card, the emperor, which we're discussing here, is also revealed in the astrological doctrine concerning Jupiter. The correspondence as such remains intact, but there is a world of difference between these two statements here. Because in the case of the first statement, one remains an astrologer and nothing but an astrologer, whilst in the second statement, one is thinking as a hermeticist, although remaining an astrologer if one is one. Hermetic philosophy is not composed of the Kabbalah, astrology, magic, and alchemy. These four branches sprouting from the trunk do not make the trunk, rather they live from the trunk. The trunk is the manifested unity of mysticism, gnosis, and sacred magic. There are no theories, there is only experience, including here the intellectual experience of arcana and symbols. Mystical experience is the root, the Gnostic experience of revelation is the sap, and the experience or practice of sacred magic is the wood. For this reason, its teaching, or the quote-unquote body of its tradition, consists of spiritual exercises, and all its arcana, including the arcana of the Tarot, are practical spiritual exercises whose aim is to awaken from sleep every, every deep layer of consciousness. Necessary commentaries and corollaries accompanying this practice and constitute the quote-unquote bark of the trunk. Thus, the key to the apocalypse of St. John is nowhere to be found, for it is not at all a matter of interpreting it with a view of extracting a philosophical, metaphysical, or historical system. It's important. The key to the apocalypse is to practice it, to make use of it as a book of spiritual exercises which awaken from sleep ever deeper layers of consciousness. The seven letters to the churches, the seven seals of the sealed book, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials signify altogether a course of spiritual exercises composed of 28 exercises. For as the apocalypse is a revelation put into writing, it is necessary in order to understand it, to establish in oneself a state of consciousness which is suited to receive revelations. And here's the key to this practice. It is the state of concentration without effort taught by the first arcanum, which is the magician. So here he's given a, uh, a summary of the first three arcana, the first three symbols of the tarot. He says, It is the state of concentration without effort, the magician, taught in the first arcanum, followed by a vigilant inner silence, taught by the second arcanum, which becomes an inspired activity of imagination and thought, where the conscious self acts together with superconsciousness, which is the third arcana. Lastly, the conscious self halts its creative activity and contemplates in letting pass and review everything which preceded with a view to surmising it, practical teaching of the fourth arcanum. The mastery of these four psychurgical operations symbolized by the magician, one, the high priestess, two, the empress, three, and the emperor here, four, is key to the apocalypse. One, in, one will search in vain for another. You are with me. Please let me know what you think about that statement right there. And that was a good summary of where we are at this point in the book. So the Gospels likewise are spiritual exercises, he says. One has not only to read and reread them, but also to plunge entirely into their element, to breathe their air, to participate as an eyewitness, as it were, in the events described there. And all this not in a scrutinizing way, but as an admirer with ever-growing admiration. The Old Testament also contains parts which are spiritual exercises. 
The Jewish Kabbalist, the author and authors of the Zohar, for example, make such use of it. And it is thus the Kabbalah originated and that it lives. The difference between Kabbalists and other faithful depends only on the fact that the former drew spiritual exercises from the scripture whilst the latter studied it and believed it. The aim of spiritual exercises is depth, he says. It is necessary to become deep in order to be able to attain experience and knowledge of profound things. And it is symbolism which is the language of depth. Thus, arcana expressed by symbols are both the means and the aim of the spiritual exercise of which the living tradition of hermetic philosophy is exposed or composed. Spiritual exercise in common form, the common link that unites hermeticists. It is not knowledge in common with in common which unites them, but rather the spiritual exercises and the experience which goes hand in hand with them. This is interesting here. If three people, he says, he brings an example, three people from from three different countries were to meet, meet each other, having made one, the book of Genesis of Moses, two, the gospel of St. John, and three, the vision of Ezekiel, the subject of spiritual exercises for many years, each with each of those texts, they would do so in brotherhood, although the one would know the history. The one, the, the reader of uh, Genesis by Moses, would know the history of humanity. The other, the Gospel of St. John, would have the science of healing. And the third would make profound Kabbalist. That which one knows is the result of personal experience and orientation, whilst depth to which one attains, disregarding the aspect of the extent of knowledge that one has gained, is what one has in common. Hermeticism, the hermetic tradition, is in the first place, and above all, a certain degree of depth, a certain nevu of consciousness. And it is the practice of spiritual exercise which safeguards this. With respect to the knowledge of individual hermeticists, and this is applicable to initiates as well, it depends upon the individual vocation of each one of them. The task that one per pursues determines the nature and the extent not only of the one uh, one has the experience and gains knowledge by that which is necessary for the accomplishments of the task which proceeds from one's individual vocation. In other words, one knows that which is necessary in order to be informed and to be able to orient oneself in the domain relevant to one's own individual vocation. Thus, a hermeticist whose vocation is healing would know things about the relationships between consciousness, the system of the lotus flower for, uh, or chakras, the nervous system, and the system of endocrine glands, that another hermeticist whose vocation is the spiritual history of humanity would not know. Hermeticist whose vocation is the spiritual history of humanity would not know, but this latter, in his turn, would know things ignored by the healer, facts of the past of the, uh, and of the present concerning relationships between the spiritual hierarchies and humanity between that which took place or is taking place above that which took place and is taking place below. But this knowing, insofar it is not a matter of arcana, consists of facts, though often of a purely spiritual nature and not theories. Thus, for example, reincarnation, here's where we're going to get into reincarnation. Um, thus, for the example, reincarnation is in no way a theory which one has to believe or not believe. In Hermeticism, no one would dream of putting forward a case in order to persuade or even to dissuade people of the truth of reincarnation theory. For the Hermeticist, it is a fact which is either known through experience or ignored. Just as one does not make a propaganda for or against the fact that we sleep at night and wake up anew each morning, for this is a matter of experience, so is the fact that we die and are born anew a matter of uh, experience, i.e. either one has certainty about it or else one does not. But those who are certain should know that ignorance of reincarnation often has very profound and even sublime reasons associated with the vocation of the person in question. This is fascinating because he gets into the importance of disavowing reincarnation for certain vocations in present life. And he brings in priests here as, uh, as specific and scientists. Um, so he says, when, for example, a person has a vocation which demands a maximum of concentration in the present, he may renounce all spiritual memories of the past. Because the awakened memory is not always beneficial, it is often a burden. 
It is so above all when it is a matter of a vocation, which demands an attitude entirely free of all prejudice, as is the case with the vocation of priest, doctor, and, du- and judge. The priest, doctor, and judge have to concentrate themselves in such a way on the tasks of the present that they must not be distracted by memories of former existences. Now, he's not, he's not saying there that we, or one would need to persuade the priest, the doctor, and the judge against the idea of, or the concept of reincarnation. It's just not a focus for this vocation. Moving on, one can perform miracles without the memory of former lives, as was the case with the holy vicar of ours, and one can also perform miracles wholly in possession of this memory, as was the case of Monsieur Philippe of Lyons. For reincarnation is neither a dogma, i.e. truth necessary for salvation, nor a heresy, contrary to a truth necessary for salvation. It is simply a fact of experience, just as sleep and heredity are. As such, it is neutral. Everything depends on its interpretation. Not sure. Let me know what you think about this this claim on reincarnation so far. If you don't mind in the comments. Everything depends on its interpretation. One can interpret it in such a manner as to make it a hymn to the glory of God. And one can interpret it in such a manner to make it blasphemy. When one says to forgive is to grant the opportunity to begin again, God forgives more than 70 times 70 times, always granting us opportunities anew. What infinite goodness of God. Here is an interpretation to the glory of God. But one says there's a mechanism of infinite evolution and one is morally determined by previous lives. There is no grace. There is only the law of cause and effect. And this is a blasphemous interpretation. It reduces God to the function of the engineer of a moral machine. Reincarnation is in no way an exception in what is liable to a double interpretation. In fact, every pertinent fact is liable to it. Thus, for example, heredity heredity can be interpreted in the sense of complete determinism, therefore excluding freedom and thus also morality. Or rather, it can be interpreted as a possibility for gradual improvement over the organism in order to render it more perfect instrument or to vocations for posterity. Didn't Abraham receive the promise that the Messiah would come in his lineage? Wasn't this same promise given to David? Nevertheless, whatever the personal interpretation of a fact may be, a fact remains a fact and it is necessary to know it when one wants to orient oneself in in the domain in which it belongs. Thus, hermeticists have knowledge of diverse facts according to their personal vocations. But hermetic philosophy is nevertheless not the sum total of knowledge acquired by individuals. It is an organism of arcana expressed in symbols which are at the same time both spiritual exercises and their resulting aptitudes. An arcanum practiced as a spiritual exercise for a sufficient length of time becomes an aptitude. It does not give the pupil knowledge of new facts, but makes him suited to acquire such knowledge when he has a need of it. Initiation is the capacity of orienting oneself in every domain and of acquiring their knowledge of relevant uh, relevant facts, quote-unquote the key facts. The initiate is one who knows how to attain knowledge, one who knows how to ask, seek, and put into practice the appropriate means in order to succeed. So this reminds me, this is why I think you see so many people uh, for, for like Freemasonry and a lot of these uh, secret societies that leverage this hermetic uh, philosophy. Um, you know, they are successful in their domains, whether it's music or art or building, whatever it may be, politics. Um, but just, there's a big problem there, right? And it's this general orientation uh, that this hermetic philosophy, this hermetic, yeah, hermeticism can be used and is most no, most apparent to us in its use as a disintegrating force. Um, this is an aside there. Spiritual exercise alone have taught him no theory or doctrine, however luminous, may in any way have rendered him capable of, quote, knowing how to know. Spiritual exercises have taught him practical sense, And in the hermetic philosophy, there is no other sense than the practical and the infallible effectiveness of the arcama of the three united endeavors, which is the basis of every spiritual exercise, every arcanum, namely, quote from Luke, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Actually, a quote that I have. 
right there. Interesting, I saw that. You can't see it, but on the left side there. Sorry. Thus, hermetic philosophy does not teach what one ought to believe concerning God, man, and nature, but it teaches rather how to ask, seek, and knock in order to arrive at mystical experience, Gnostic illumination, and the magical effect of that which one seeks to know about God, man, and nature. And it is after having asked, sought, and knocked, and after one has received, found, and gained access that one knows. This kind of knowing, and this is the ultimate definition of the emperor here, this kind of knowing, the certainty of the synthetic comprehension of mystical experience, Gnostic revelation, and magical effort, is the emperor. This is the practical teaching of the fourth card of the tarot. And I think I'm going to leave it there, actually. There's a little bit left, but uh, I think that's a good place to stop. So thanks for listening. Um, you know, I hope you got this far from part one as well. Let me know what you guys think. I'll be having a talk on this uh, essay or this chapter uh, with Nail Heil from um, Grail Country uh, in a couple of weeks. So I look forward to getting into that. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. God bless.